All right, everybody, we are back now. Hopefully you got that last tiny bit. Um, so this is uh, Media Part 2, and it will also be in one recording. It should be a touch to touch shorter. All right, so let's pick up with news reporting and broadcast news. We're talking about, like, the big three networks, you know, on regular network TV, uh, their half-hour newscast um, in the evening. Um, they are aimed at low levels of sophistication, and it's more on entertainment value and unless there is a really huge story because they have to get people to watch you've got only you've got a 30 minute broadcast and you've probably got 10 minutes of commercials so they have 20 minutes of time to report what you're going to report and obviously that's not nearly enough time to report on all of the events that are going on so they get their information then from well-established sources now they don't dig they don't uncover it's like they just okay those are my sources, and I'll call them, and what they tell me, then I'll do. It's not like the old days where, where they would dig and dig and dig and try to get stuff. It's a little bit different than that. Uh, major reporters, you might see this word, a, a beat. So I'm going to tell you what a beat is. Major reporters are assigned to beats, like the White House, these, you know, CBS's chief White House correspondent. That's their beat. Or their chief defense correspondent or chief Pentagon correspondent is their they're, they're, uh, they're head person at the Defense Department, and they have a Congress one, a State Department one, et cetera. Um, so that's what their beat is. Their beat is the Pentagon. Their beat is the State Department, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> News reporting. The sources that I just talked about, they also need the media. The media needs the sources, and the sources need the media. But the media, they need the, the, the sources need the media to spread the information that they want. Okay, and the media can either go along with that or not. Um, sometimes they will float what are called trial balloons. Uh, so we'll do the definition, an intentional news leak to see what the political reaction would be. I think there was one not too long ago, very, very recently, a trial balloon about vaccine passports. It, was, it seemed to have been floated through sources to the media. It became this big story that the administration wants to do vaccine passports. And they, they were waiting for the reaction as if this was if this was indeed a trial balloon. And the reaction was very, very negative towards that. It's like, no way, we are not going to have vaccine passports. And so that allows the, uh, the political entity, in this case, if it were the White House doing it, it would allow them to go, hey, that was never our idea. I don't know where you came up with that. Uh, or if it's got a good reaction, they could take credit for it and say, yeah, okay, we'll go ahead and do this. So sometimes they do that just to gauge a reaction to see what might happen. If there's a negative reaction, they'll just say, yeah, um, either we're not going to do that or, yeah, that wasn't us or something like that. <clears throat> so relationships between the media and government can be difficult with this idea because, remember, the media needs the sources. The sources need the media, but they don't want the negative information to be reported. So it is this constant um, uh, tug of war between those two things. They need the media to get their message out. The media needs them to have sources, but the media also might not want to get the message out that they want. Right, I'm going to pause. Okay, on we go. All right, so now the presenting of the news. Again, so because of this broadcast, and we're not talking about the 24-7s, we're not talking about CS, no, sorry, CNN, MSNBC, or Fox. We're talking about the evening news for the networks. Okay, they got to fit into small segments. They're really just a bunch of headlines because they just don't have the time. So there's very little analysis. They can't spend time on analysis. So we end up with the idea that the issues are too complex for a short newscast. So what we have is this soundbite news. Remember, I used that term in the last uh, <coughs> last presentation, the 30-second presidency, right? Um, because it, everything has to be so short. This political cartoon is pretty funny if you want to take the time to look at it. It's before sound bites. It's Lincoln and the uh, um, Gettysburg Address, and then after the sound bites, it's just this little bit. Okay, so it's kind of funny. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Okay, I think I got it now. All right, so let's talk about bias. There's lots of stuff out there about bias in the media. So we first have to acknowledge that there is bias in the media. Um, the thing is that it might not be specific bias. This is the political scientist stuff. Um, but bias in what's covered, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide or two. <clears throat> so if you look at this, this is a little bit old. It's even more more pronounced today. The political affiliation of journalists is very much um, tilted towards the left or tilted towards liberals or tilted towards the Democratic Party. Very, very small amount of it is tilted perhaps towards the Republican Party as far as the number of journalists out there. Okay, so and that affects things. 
um, uh, the com it comes from how they see the world as a whole. Okay, so we're going to explain this in the next slide or two. Um, so the coverage of social issues by these journalists leans to the left because their sympathies lean to the left. So they're looking at it from their worldview. So that's the way that the bias can leak in. It also is about what they choose to do. This is a broadcast is so short, you a lot of decisions have to be made by either the anchor or the producers or whatever to show. So those decisions have to be made. So the decisions about what you see and don't see can then go to that direction. That's what we mean by bias. Maybe not, maybe not um, um, on purpose, but just because of worldview. Okay, because they have to make decisions. So they're, the stories have to generate pictures. The stories have to have entertainment value. They can be quite arbitrary in nature. And then that's where we get this term that you have to know that the media becomes, it did become, and it still is to some extent, the gatekeeper. Although with social media out there and the internet, that, that function has been lost or certainly been rendered um, less important. But you do need to know that term. The media, by the choosing of what they do and what they show and what they talk about, they become the gatekeepers of knowledge. That's what, one of those things that happens. So how does this then impact public opinion? The impact, the media impact on public opinion. Very important ideas in here. Number one, it's very hard to determine direct impact, but there are indirect ones. And again, we got a bolded statement in here, second half of the sentence. It's not necessarily in the creation of news, but it can affect what we see as important. If we only see these things, then those are the things that the public as a whole sees are important. So they, this function happens. This gatekeeper function can lead to the public opinion effect because that's what we see. Um, what the media emphasizes could have an effect. This sort of goes along with that. The media can set the political agenda. Okay, another bolded statement here. The media can set that by what they choose to show and what we see and consume. Um, it does focus public attention, and I'll give you examples. These are not testable pieces, but I'll give you an example. In 1992, this is Bush versus Clinton. <clears throat> the economy was recovering from a short recession. The inflation level was low. The interest rates were low. The, the economy was really starting to roar back, but the media focused on the recession part. It was detrimental to George H.W. Bush. It was one of the main reasons why he lost that election to Clinton. The Clinton campaign continued to say, remember, this was a short recession, a mild recession. The Clinton campaign campaign saying it's the worst economy in the last 50 years. That's what became the focus. That's what the news focused on which it wasn't the worst economy in the last 50 years, but it became that because of the media focus. <clears throat> also, just a media focus in 2000, this is Gore versus Bush. The character questions about Clinton that came up during his last term, um, especially in 1998 with the Lewinsky stuff and all of that, and he got impeached, um, that affected Gore. That attached itself to Gore because Gore was his vice president for those eight years. And so Gore tried to separate himself from that, but he couldn't. It's one of the reasons why Gore lost, um, which makes the media, of course, a key political institution, right? They control the technology that controls what we believe about politics and government. And now it's social media, and it's those big tech companies. It's the Googles. It's the Facebooks. It's the, um, the Twitters out there that do start to control the technology that controls what we see. Okay, so that's something we have to deal with. Um, two slides left. Number one, so it's our last of our linkage institutions. Remember, this is this is one of them <coughs> of the four that we have, right? And of course, what does that do? Links policy makers and the people. It of course has a huge impact. The media, with well, those things we just talked about, have a huge impact on the policy agenda. They also serve as what's called a watchdog function that does restrict politicians. Okay, that reduces the scope of what government can do if they are really being a watchdog. And contrary to what you might think, the televised media, and then certainly now the social media, has also spread individualism. It has made people more individuals, even though they're all seeing this stuff. And the, the idea here is, is that individual voters can now see the candidates in person. Prior to television, you, you didn't see a candidate. It was a newspaper. You saw pictures. The candidates didn't go a whole lot of places anyway. And so all you saw was that, or you might have heard them on the radio. Now we can see them. 
We see them. We see them live. We see them taped. We see them in social media. We see them. So there's less need for those social groups that we used to have or the political parties. Remember, we are all, are all uh, sort of separating ourselves more and more from political parties and more and more identifying people as a whole are identifying themselves as independent as opposed to Republican or Democrat. <clears throat> those things have weakened because of this. <clears throat> and now the candidate personality is much more important, much more important than it used to be. And again, starting back in 1960 with that debate, you could see uh, the personality differences and, and the, the charisma differences between Kennedy and Nixon. So lastly then, the consequences of this media environment that we have. Number one, it's consumer driven. They have to drive people to their media. So they have to drive to, with the idea of consumers. Okay, so we have to, we are the consumers and it's driven by us. That increases polarization in which we have today. We have a massive increase in polarization because we go to our preferred sources. You're going to find diehard Fox people, you're going to find diehard CNN people, and they're going to continue to drive themselves because they seek out the things that affirm each other, that affirm, I'm sorry, not each other, that affirm their already beliefs. You guys may be part of that, you may not be, but that is one of the things that happened is causing more and more polarization. Plus, we also have this concentration of media ownership. We talked about that in the last presentation. One of the things that drives here as a consequence is the increase in similarity of news coverage. For instance, the ABC, right? ABC has their big station, you know, the national station, but every city has their own affiliate, right? Atlanta has uh, Channel 2, is, is ABC uh, owned, and every other city has them. And so unless it's something localized in Atlanta or localized in Charlotte or whatever it is, it's going to be the same stuff because they're going to get their stuff. The, the ABC, um, the major national stories come from the ABC national station. So you're going to see the same story in Atlanta and in Denver and, in, and somewhere in Washington or whatever. So there's an increased similarity in news coverage. Plus, we've mentioned this three or four times throughout the course, right? Horse race journalism, the less the public, less public knowledge of actual platforms of the various candidates and all about who's ahead and who's behind. <clears throat> has, has Clinton uh, extended her lead over Trump this week? Has Trump uh, closed the gap? Has, uh, has Trump closed the gap on Biden? Has Biden spread out the leads? All that stuff. It all becomes the story. <clears throat> and then lastly, this demand for instantaneous news coverage that we have, and we all have it, whether it's news, we have a demand, we have an instantaneous demand for everything that we do, right? Uh, you're on your phone, you're on your computer, whatever it is. Um, the 24-hour news operations and the online media consumption has gigantically um, affected the uh, the political scene in the United States. All right, so with this, we are actually finished with all the information we need for the course. Um, so we are done with new information. That's a big yay, right? Um, we uh, have tests coming up on Unit 5, and then we'll do reviews and we'll do some more writing uh, before the exam on May 3rd. So uh, with that, uh, last part of the lecture, uh, I'm glad to have shared this stuff with you, and we will do more stuff here in the next couple weeks. See you then. Oh, last thing, trust in media has decreased dramatically. Sorry.